Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Hello, this is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to the Goddess Kring podcast number 14. This is going to be airing on January 19th, 2017, the day before the presidential inauguration. As some of you know, I am a huge, 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 huge Bernie, Sanders huge fan. Bernie Sanders fan. He was my favorite candidate for president of the United States of America. And I'm really happy that Bernie Sanders is speaking out about uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. And I will say that my own personal life experience with health care is that luckily here in Washington State, even before we had Obamacare, I had a sliding scale health care in a local community clinic here near Capitol Hill slash Central District where I live. I've lived in Seattle since 1986 when I moved here after graduating from high school on Whidbey Island. And I went to a community clinic here and I had a sliding scale that I had to pay $20 per visit, which was pretty amazingly good deal. I've been low income most of my life for a few different reasons. One of them is depression and anxiety and various challenges that I have. And I just happen to mostly have jobs that just were not super high pay. Uh, right now I work as a model for medical students, art students, as well as deliver groceries part time, randomly off and on. And I mix that and fill in the gaps of my art and medical modeling. As an art and medical model, I get anywhere between 15 to $30 an hour for medical uh, modeling. It's like $30 an hour sometimes minus taxes. The problem is they only hire you every once in a while here and there. So it's just kind of random and sporadic. So that's a high hourly wage minus taxes, but it's not a full-time thing that I do. So, and then when I model for art classes, it's between 15 and $23 an hour minus taxes. So I pay my own taxes on most of that. And some of the schools where I model take the taxes out just like a regular job. But a lot of it is 1099 income, so I take about 20% out. So I make a little bit less than that per hour. So I will say with the Affordable Health Care Act, I am somebody who loves my Obamacare. I am low income to the point where my health care monthly fee is zero. And I know other people who are low income who pay $100 a month, which I actually don't think is very cheap. But... um depends on how much money you make if that's affordable or not I also know somebody who pays $700 a month so I'm thinking well that does not depending on how much you actually make $700 a month for health care does not really sound affordable but I will say that I also have a friend in England Scotland um, Norway and Canada and all of them are happy with their health care and they live in countries where they have national single payer health care, which means that part of your taxes goes to health care and medical services are considered a public service for everyone, young, old, rich, poor, sick and healthy. And none of my friends in these other countries, Norway, Scotland, England, Canada, none of them have big medical bills and none of them have to worry about ever receiving large medical bills, whether they need an ambulance ride, uh, a surgical operation, give birth to a child, you know, need serious medical attention or just go in for a checkup. And I'm not sure about uh, vision and dental. I think that in Norway, they don't really have a very good dental situation. So I don't know why dental is considered separate from other medical care. I think that should change. So what I'm saying is even countries that have socialized single payer medicine don't always seem to have uh, dental covered as part of that, which is kind of odd to me. But let's just say that I'm somebody who believes that medical care should be part of taxes. And my friend in England says that he, 
I think he makes the equivalent of about $2,000 a month minus taxes. And I think only about $100 a month of that is taken out by the British government for his national health care, NHS, National Health Service. Um, I know that there has been budget cuts and things going on in England that are making it worse for them there, perhaps. But generally, it still works really well there. And I've asked my friends many questions about their health care. And most of them are happy with it. And it's really sad to me that corporations and big pharma is allowed to be such a high for-profit industry. And that needs to change. So I'm somebody who likes my Obamacare as well as I acknowledge that it could be improved. Because it seems like, from what I've heard, Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, ACA slash Obamacare, it's the same thing. Some people think those are two different things. It's the same thing. It seems to me that it only really works well if you're low income like me, if you're middle class, and if you're wealthy, of course, everything is fine because you can actually just pay thousands of dollars for medical care and you can afford it. Although I'm sure even wealthy people don't want huge medical bills because they tend to be penny pinchers, wealthy people. So let's just say that it does seem like the Affordable Health Care Act could improve and my desire would be for it to expand. So I don't want to talk on this podcast about all the horrible things that may or may not be happening with the new administration because I don't want to freak out and worry and I don't watch a lot of mainstream news because it's just full of gossip and drama, drama, drama and sensationalized, you know, fear mongering, etc. I do believe in taking seriously what's happening and the changes that might occur that might be negative. And I do believe in women's rights and abortion rights and pro-choice and health care for all. But I'm talking on this podcast about what I want to happen, not what may or may not happen that's horrible. So my fantasy would be that Obamacare would be expanded and that we would switch to a single payer nonprofit health care system. We actually, as United States, we actually spend so, 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 so much on health care. And they always say the rising costs of health care. But that's because somebody is choosing to make it that expensive because there's all these rules and these for-profit insurance companies and all these loopholes and corporations not paying their taxes. And the U.S. government doesn't step in and tell Big Pharma that they can't rip us off. And basically, price gouging is legal in the United States, and I don't think it's actually supposed to be legal. So our healthcare system needs to be, you know, if we're going to drain the swamp, let's drain the swamp of the corrupt healthcare system in the United States, which is based on capitalism and profit and competition. And a lot of people say competition is good in healthcare. I don't agree. I don't think that competition should be part of, I mean, they're saying competition, so keep the prices low. You know, like if somebody is selling ginormous televisions, whoever has the best sale is going to sell the TV. I don't think healthcare should be seen as a product that we're buying and that we need to get it on sale. I think that healthcare should be like the public library or the fire department. It should be for all. It should be paid for by taxes. And the prices should be kept as low as possible. And I do believe that doctors and nurses should be well paid. But I believe that we should eliminate for-profit insurance companies that make people fill out lots of forms and have all these administrative fees and costs that really have nothing to do with actual medical care and medical treatment. And in fact, I don't actually want health insurance. I want medical treatment. I want health care, not health insurance. You know, like insuring if you pay, you're not going to get sick. That's not true. People get sick, whether they're healthy to start with or not. So I, I wish our whole industry, I wish the whole industry actually that we call medical treatment or health care or health insurance would be changed into a public service like the public library. You know, I've said this before. Imagine going into a public library and having to pay three to five hundred dollars for a library book, having to pay six hundred or seven hundred dollars to rent a video. I mean, imagine that's that's how absurd our medical system is. I I know some women are charged $30,000 to have a C-section when they try to have a vaginal birth and it doesn't work out. 
and then they have a C-section instead, and then they get billed $30,000, depending on if their insurance is any good. And even my dad, who makes good money and still works full-time at a law firm, he actually has pretty good, he says, insurance through his full-time job that he's been at for like 25, 30 years, or 20 years, I guess. But he actually flies to Costa Rica because he doesn't have great dental coverage. And he recently needed lots and lots and lots of dental work on his molars. And he said it would have cost about, even with his dental insurance, $20,000 to get his teeth um, worked on. And so he flew to Costa Rica and he stayed in a hotel, not a fancy hotel, a bargain hotel. And he flew to Costa Rica, stayed in a hotel, and got all of his dental work done, and it was $5,000 versus $20,000. So that's with airfare and hotel and dental work. 400% cheaper in Costa Rica, and his dentist was perfectly good, he said. So very interesting how different it works in other countries in a more nonprofit kind of way. So again, I do believe doctors and nurses should be paid well for their work that they do. But I also think that medicine should not be for profit. So we need to eliminate the waste and keep the costs down. And I know that's possible. In other countries, they do that. In other countries, they spend less per person. If you do the math, I know that the United States is a very, very large country. But if you do the math on per person proportionately, the United States spends more per person and doesn't cover everyone then other countries spend less and cover everyone as part of their taxes. So built into taxes, I also think healthcare should have nothing to do with your job. So companies that you work for should not have to cover employees and give them health insurance. Therefore, the company could focus on just being a company and doing what they do best. And then healthcare would be part of our national single payer insurance system. I know that Medicare and Medicaid could be a lot better. Like, I love my Obamacare. I'm low income and I get free dental vision and regular checkups and I also get free psychiatric treatment. I get free therapy, basically. So I can see a therapist once a week and that's covered. And there's no bill to me and no fee. Now, usually therapy costs between $60 and $120 an hour. So that's very different. And even before Obamacare, I had $20 per visit sliding scale community clinic that I could go to, which is amazing, and I'm very grateful. So I also get, a, a, I can go to the eye doctor once a year for a free checkup, and I can go to the dentist once a year and get fillings and a cleaning. And I can get a regular physical exam and a few other things. So I can get basic care. I'm not sure how much it would cost if I needed surgery or if I needed some major type medical thing. Dental, visual, vis vision, dental, or regular medical. I'm not really sure. I wonder. But what's sad is that my mom is a low-income senior and she's on Medicare or Medicaid, whatever it's called when you're a senior and you're low-income. And she has to pay for hers. And she not only that, my mom is not on any kind of medication right now. She doesn't need any medication. She's 69 years old. She's pretty healthy. And yet she told me she has to pay 20, $21 a month for this sort of prescription drug insurance program, but she doesn't need anything. And they said that she has to pay it anyway, because if she ever does need it, it will cost her tons of money unless she pays $20 a month now. I think that's really silly. I don't think she should have to pay anything. And then I think if she starts needing medication, then she should start having to pay a monthly fee for that. But not, or maybe just taxes. I just think it's absurd to make people pay for things and they're not getting anything for their money. So, and again, my friend in England, I think he only pays about $100 a month out of a $2,000 a month salary. And the government automatically takes it out of his paycheck. But it's not through his employment. It's through the National Health Service. So that's what I wish the United States would do, is come up with some kind of single-payer, nonprofit health care system. Not health insurance, but health care. Where everyone is covered and a, and a percentage of your paycheck gets taken out automatically by the government. 
and then you get an insurance card, a health medical care card, and you just show that to them when you go to the doctor. And it should cover dental, vision, and regular physical exams and pharmaceuticals. And they should not allow pharmaceutical companies to rip us off and price gouge when something costs a lot less in Canada or the UK or Germany or Switzerland or Spain or France or, you know, most other countries, Cuba, most other countries, uh, medications cost a lot less than they do in the United States of America. And they lie to us and say it's because American drugs are better and safer and more tested. Not true, actually. A lot of this stuff is exactly the same kind of stuff and charged a lot less for it. So we need to change the system. So that's how I feel about that. So now, again, this is Shannon Kringen. You're watching Goddess Kring. This is podcast number 14. In honor of Martin Luther King, I will say it is now January 19th, 2017. So we just had Martin Luther King Day here in the United States of America. And Martin Luther King is definitely a hero of mine. His favorite, my favorite speech of his is one called Beyond Vietnam. If you just Google Martin Luther King Beyond Vietnam, you can hear the entire transcript. And if you want to talk about conspiracy theories or whatever, (laughs) what I think actually upset whoever assassinated Martin Luther King, whoever really did assassinate him. I think that what really upset people about him that didn't like him was his statements in the Beyond Vietnam speech, where he talks about the military industrial complex, and he talks about spiritual bankruptcy. And he talks about the dangers of when war and money take over and the military industrial complex and capitalism take over and they're out of control and it's all about greed and money and competition and war and domination and then you don't take care of people that are poor and people that are ill or elderly the weaker people you don't take care of those people and it's all about competition and making money That's approaching spiritual bankruptcy. And if you spend more on the military and war and combat and defense than you do on social programs, he said that's that's approaching spiritual death. And he says that's what's really dangerous and that's what's really not fair and unjust about humankind. And then he talks about the Vietnam War and how the Viet Cong are real human beings too and to just think of them as the enemy is a very dangerous idea, turning people into us versus them. I mean, that's what a lot of wars are based upon, is that they're the bad guy and we're the good guy, so we better get them before they get us. That kind of mentality only just perpetuates war, and then you have more war, and then you have revenge and fear and anger and more war and more violence, and it never ends. So it's really sad, So and it just becomes a big pile of hypocrisy. That's not democracy, that's hypocrisy. So that's what I feel about that. And, you know, you listen to that speech, Beyond Vietnam, by Martin Luther King. And I think that was recorded about a year before he died. And it's an amazing speech. And I think that his ideas, I, I of course, I love his civil rights um, activism and his acknowledgement of how racist people can be and how that's really not okay but he also expanded that to include poverty classism sexism warism and I would expand that to say speciesism you know when human beings are arrogant enough to think that they are the boss of the universe and when any one race thinks that it's superior to another race that is really a tragedy because then we eliminate the unity the, you know there's unity in diversity So if we acknowledge the oneness of humankind and we stop labeling each other us versus them and we realize most of us want the same thing. Most of us want to be safe. We want food and water and people to love us and safety and security. Most people are not fanatical. Most people are not violent and want to harm each other. Although there are some sociopathic people in the world, I think most people are not sociopaths. Thankfully, Otherwise, we'd really be in trouble. 
So I think that expanding that, not just uh, racism, but also sexism and classism, which would include when, when large corporations dominate the world and pollute the environment and harm people because they just want to make money, just like the uh, factory farm industry. I mean, I eat meat, but I feel conflicted about it because if my heart was really pure, I probably would be vegetarian or I would kill my own meat or I would only buy very expensive meat that was produced in small farms where I knew the animals were treated humanely and fed healthy food and not pumped full of antibiotics and hormones and thrown into cages and have, you know, having a torturous life and, you know, being slaves to humans. I don't consume a lot of dairy products because I want, for one thing, I think that dairy products are not actually good for my body. They're made for cows. You know, cow milk is for baby cows, not really for humans. That's how I feel. But I know that that's actually literally true. Some people are lactose intolerant. I seem to be okay with dairy, but I do feel much healthier when I don't consume cow milk. So, and also just the way they treat the cows. I visited some dairy farms many years ago and I was upset about what I saw. Even the small dairy farms, the cows looked pretty unhappy and thought it was cruel and abusive to take the calves away from the mothers and not let them nurse. So I was thinking Martin Luther King's speech beyond Vietnam also includes the idea of social justice, the idea of humans treating the planet with respect. I mean, think about the Vietnam or all the wars. Think about Hiroshima. Think about all the wars and the bombs that have been dropped it's not just humans that suffer, the plants and the animals. I think about what happens in Israel and Palestine and the violence that happens there in Syria. And I think about how sad it is for the humans, but I also think about the plants and animals. What about all the dogs and cats and chickens and cows and goats and horses and all the plants and all the trees, you know, all of the fruit orchards, all of the gardens, all of the amazing trees that grow and you know the plants and animals don't know anything about the human wars that we fight and I think of how, how sad it is when there's a bomb dropped there's human life lost there's also plants and animals that are destroyed and annihilated and there's pollution left behind when these bombs are dropped and when these wars are fought so I wish that more money and time would be put into cleaning up the mess of war and more solar panels could be installed everywhere and no fracking and no pipelines installed. So Martin Luther King's speech just made me think of all these different things when he talks about the unity of humanity and the injustice of capitalism and how extreme unregulated capitalism that is really, really competitive and puts corporations and wealthy people way, way, way high up and then it makes middle class and poor people sort of slaves to the rich, wealthy elite that control things and have more power. See, that's the dark side of capitalism when we have this extreme competition. We have corporations that don't even pay taxes. There's a poem I wrote, Increase cooperation, decrease the corporation. Maybe I'll play that next on my show. So it's in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. I might actually play that next. So that's one of the Goddess Kring poems that I wrote. So the Martin Luther King speech that I think is his greatest speech of all is Beyond Vietnam because he expands his civil rights ideas to also include the injustice of poverty and extreme capitalism that can oppress people. See, capitalism, having a free market and, and allowing people to start their own businesses and be entrepreneurs and be competitive in a good way and have their own business and pay taxes, that's cool, that's great. That's a good part of capitalism, the freedom to do that, the freedom to have business and make a profit. But when you have capitalism that's so extreme and basically makes it really, really hard for low income and poor people and middle class people to get ahead and makes it a lot easier for the wealthy to do things and not even pay taxes, whereas the poor and middle class have to pay a higher percentage of their income on taxes. That's not fair. So capitalism needs to have a little bit of socialism mixed in, meaning 
We all pay taxes and we all get good mass transit and we all get health care and basic rights and unions should be allowed to exist and wages should not be so low. When you have wealthy CEOs making like 3,000 times or 300 or 400 percent more than the entry level worker, that's out of control. I know that that's another thing about the United States. Not only do we not give everyone health care and we spend a lot of money on health care and it's a for-profit industry, we also have one of the largest wage gaps where the, the people high up in companies and large corporations make lots and lots and lots of money, maybe too much money, and then entry-level workers make like $7 an hour. I mean, I can't believe that federal minimum wage is like less than eight dollars an hour. I mean, in 1994, I made seven fifty an hour, which was minimum wage at the time. In 1994, so it's hard for me to believe that federal minimum wage in the United States is still only seven dollars and something per hour, or eight dollars an hour. That is insane because if you add up inflation, seven dollars an hour now is a lot less than seven dollars an hour was in 1994 when I worked for that. I remember in 1986, I worked at a pizza place and I made three thirty-five an hour, which was minimum wage. That's crazy. And now it's only seven something. I think minimum wage federally should be about $15 an hour. So I, I feel like, you know, that should be changed. There should be maximum income and minimum wage should be increased and maximum wage should be decreased. I don't think there even is a maximum wage. In other words, people can make as much money as a corporation wants them to or allows them to. So that's not fair to the low income workers. That's not fair to entry level and, and, and medium level workers. I feel like there should be more of a gradual ladder. People can be entry-level workers and make $15 an hour, and if it's a large corporation, they should be able to climb, 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 climb. And there shouldn't be like the CEO of the company making $5,000 an hour or $500,000 a year or whatever, you know, tons and tons and tons of money. That's not fair. There could be more, an equ more of an equal distribution of wealth. And I'm not talking communism here. I'm talking about entry-level workers, medium level workers and high level workers climbing a ladder and gradually making more and more money per hour. The harder they work and the higher up they get in the company. So it should be more of an ethical fair and there should be unions that protect people and let them get high wages and get paid vacation and maternity leave and health care should just be part of our taxes. So now I think I'll play my poem in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation. So this is Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, podcast number 14. Thanks for tuning in. You can go to my website, shannonkringen.com, for more information on my artwork, questions, comments, etc. I do abstract paintings and drawings. I paint onto shoes. I take photos. I do many, many, many different kinds of art. Check it out. ShannyKringen.com. Thank you. In cast the outcast. In cast the outcast. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. In cast the outcast. In cast the outcast. Fragile sense of self. Tangible desire for wealth. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. 
incast, the outcast, outcast, the incast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation, fragile sense of self, tangible desire for wealth. Authentic ejaculation of my soul, molten orange, liquid glow, anger takes its toll, in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Fragile sense of self, tangible desire for wealth. In cast the outcast, outcast, the in-cast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation. Iconoclast landed here, iconoclast landed here. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation. Mummy, <laughs> unwrap the mummy running, clap away the trap. A cano class landed here in cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Blasting, puritanical, canister, common ground, astounded in the round, center well, do tell, out of shell, unguarded, no longer martyred, Vexing, letting ampersands free to a degree, free to be you and me. Uncover what's within, releasing chemical. Hardwired competition. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. Nutrition, intuition coming to fruition, thrive on dead lines, alive in headlines, thrive on dead lines, alive in headlines.
hands. Unwrap the mummy running. Unwrap the mummy running. Clap away the trap. Iconoclast landed here. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. Authentic ejaculation of my soul. Molten orange liquid glow. Anger takes its toll. Fragile sense of self. Tangible desire for wealth. Decrease the corporation. Increase cooperation. In cast the outcast. Outcast the in cast. Thrive on deadlines, alive in headlines. Thrive on deadlines, alive in headlines. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Decrease the corporation, increase cooperation. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Unwrap the mummy. Unwrap the mummy. Clap away the trap. Iconoclast landed here. Iconoclast landed here. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Blasting puritanical canister. Authentic ejaculation of our soul. Molten orange liquid glow. Anger takes its toll. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. Thrive on deadlines, alive in headlines. Thrive on deadlines, alive in headlines. In cast the outcast, outcast the in cast. So that was Incast the Outcast, Outcast the Incast. Decrease the Corporation, Increase Cooperation. So there it is. So uh, thank God for Bernie Sanders. I love that he's out there speaking out to the corporate people about the money walks and money talks, the corruption of money, and how health care and education and public services should all be available to us, rich, poor, sick, healthy, young and old, and all economic stratospheres. So <clears throat> the dark side of capitalism is what I'm talking about there. So um, in other countries, when they provide their citizens with health care and education at a more affordable cost and better mass transit, it's proof to me that 
The United States could spend money in different ways than it does. Instead of letting the wealthy corporations and wealthy people hoard the money, there could be higher wages for the low-income workers and lower wages for the extremely wealthy people and higher taxes for the extremely wealthy people and lower taxes for the low income and health care for all single payer nonprofit. That's what I wish we could do. So I will say I will talk about something else now. I wanted to talk a little bit about feminism, self esteem and body image. Yesterday, I modeled for a very unique class that wasn't really an art class. They were drawing me nude the figure model. But the class was about body image and self-esteem and healing from body shame, healing from feeling like you have to look like the perfect size, whatever Hollywood tells us that we need to look, male or female. I guess there's more pressure on women to look perfect or to be thin or whatever, but men also feel pressure, I think, to, to you know be a certain way. So I modeled for them and they wanted me to talk. And usually as the figure model, excuse me, usually as the figure model, I'm not supposed to talk. I'm supposed to just be very quiet and stand there and be kind of a statue and let them draw and hold very still. And I don't really feel objectified, but I suppose when you're a male or female figure model and you're nude in front of an art class, you are sort of seen as the model instead of Shannon, the human being, I am the model. But I don't really mind that because I'm up there Uh, giving them something to draw. So I'm up there holding still and they're drawing. So I don't really feel objectified in a negative way, but I suppose some people would say that's exploitative or objectifying myself. But I will say that um, I was a little shy about talking in front of the class and they were asking me questions. How did I get into modeling? How do I feel about my own body? Do I have shame about, you know, I think I should look more perfect in order to be a model. And it's true that when you're a figure model, like if you're a fashion model, there's a lot of pressure to look a certain way. And obviously you have to be very, very thin unless you're a plus size fashion model. Well, I'll say that I am somebody whose my weight goes up and down, but I've always been very athletic and my dad sort of raised me to exercise. And I, uh, both my parents kind of fed me pretty healthy food and wouldn't let me eat too much junk food. And I'm grateful for that now. So I will say that I really do care about health and fitness and nutrition and exercise and getting enough sleep. And so health is important. Uh, But cosmetic beauty, I think people obsess too much and they they, they get caught up in cosmetic looking the way people look instead of actually health. And so I think it's good to be fat positive and to accept yourself as having extra fat on your body but not as a way of rationalizing being unhealthy and out of shape. So I am somebody who believes in fitness and exercise and eating healthy. But I'm also somebody who is is positive about accepting your body as less than perfect, you know, as not perfect, as perfectly natural, as having extra weight, extra fat in various parts of your body. I don't think that fat is as bad as we are told. I think being extremely obese is definitely causes some physical health problems with your joints and your circulation and your cholesterol and your heart rate. But if you're like, I, I am a little bit overweight, have a little bit of extra weight in my belly that tends to go up and down. I recently uh, burned off 40 pounds of excess weight just because I stopped eating uh, wheat and grains and carbs and increased fat. Actually, I eat more fat now than I ever did. I eat a lot of avocado and nuts and stuff like that. And actually, and whole butter and whole eggs. Don't really drink milk. Uh, I eat occasional ice cream though. I enjoy that. But um, I will say that if I do eat dairy products, I eat whole fat dairy because that's healthier than low fat because it has less lactose in it. And it's just more natural the way nature intended. But I will say that, so I'm kind of a naturist and a a natural kind of person, but I will say that body image, I will say that when people get so caught up in how they look, that's silly, but wanting to be healthy and fit, that's a good healthy urge. So I am somebody who has a bit of extra weight, but I'll say that I've always exercised. So I've always felt like I was fairly healthy in terms of cardiovascular, like my heart and lungs get a lot of exercise and I have like 
good muscle tone. And so I feel in touch with my body. And so even though I'm a bit overweight by Hollywood standards, most of us are by Hollywood standards, I will say that uh, I'm more into health and being healthy than I am in thinking that I have to look perfect. So I guess it's true. I, I model and I don't torture myself about not looking perfect. I've also had breast reduction surgery. And now that I'm 48 years old, my breasts are starting to sag and my skin is getting a little wrinkly, especially in my breast area. And I have scars from breast reduction, but I model in front of people and I don't worry about my breasts looking perfect. And I have a bit of a belly. And I don't really worry about that either. And I don't shave my pubic hair. I don't shave my armpit hair. I wear a little bit of makeup, but not really much. Just a little bit of eyeliner, a little bit of lip color. Uh, now that I'm getting older, my eyebrows are getting really light. So I darken them a little bit. But I generally don't even wear makeup. And I have freckles. And sometimes I have zits on various parts of my body. I don't worry about it. I just model nude in front of people. And I don't worry. So I'm just talking about that. And then there's this feminist uh, aspect I wanted to bring up is that I went to high school with somebody who was five foot 10 and very thin. And people used to pick on her. Like people say, don't don't make fun of people if they're overweight, or they don't look beautiful, like Hollywood or whatever. But I would say also, I agree, don't don't make fun of people that don't look perfect whatever you think perfect is, but also don't pick on somebody that's thin. My high school friend, she actually became a very successful fashion model for real. She started in Seattle and then went to San Francisco and then went to New York and then went to Italy and France. And she became a very successful uh, fashion model and she was in Vogue and many different magazines and worked with a lot of famous photographers and did some runway shows and some editorial magazine spreads. And she's five foot 10 and very thin. And that's the way she was in high school. And people would call her anorexic and make fun of her. And she wasn't anorexic. And, you know, anorexia is a serious disease that some people die from. And it's really scary and sad and people need help and support. If they have an eating disorder, they need help. Uh, but the woman I went to high school with did not have an eating disorder. And yet people, I think, were jealous of her because she was like sitting there with us eating French fries and just staying thin. And, you know, she was on the track team and she exercised and rode horses and ran. And she was very physically active and very fit. But she would just eat like the rest of us, a normal food. And she just was thin. She was very tall and very thin. And she actually looked a little bit unusual and a little different, had a very long neck. So she was perfect for fashion modeling. And so I would say that if someone actually is thin naturally and they're not starving themselves, don't make fun of them. And also if they are have an eating disorder and they're thin because they don't eat much, well, then they need help. They need support. They need in whatever they need to do to be healthy. To me, it's all about health and loving yourself, whether you're overweight or underweight, whether you're thin or tall or short or have whatever skin color you have, whatever race you are, whatever ethnicity, you know, anything. It's like, what about accepting yourself and loving yourself and not, uh, not, you know, like acknowledge that there's a dark side of people being jealous of people who actually look really fit and trim or just happen to have a high metabolism and stay thin, even if they eat, you know, lots of pizza and ice cream or whatever. It's like, I, I witnessed that with my friend getting picked on for being thin. Just like if you're overweight, you get picked on for being overweight. So it's kind of like when someone is jealous or competitive with you, that can be a nasty thing. And so I think that if someone is a feminist, which which means they believe in equality for men and women and that men should be paid, women should be paid as much as men and women should have as much power as men. And I do believe men and women are equal. I believe that there's differences between male and female people. I also believe that all of us are a bit androgynous. I feel like I've got masculine traits and feminine traits and I feel like most men have male and female traits within them. So I feel like all of us are androgynous to some degree. So I don't really like to do this us and them male versus female type of a thing. I don't even know if I call myself a feminist. I'm definitely not not a feminist. But I'm the kind of feminist that does not believe in bashing men and does not believe in being abusive towards men or making fun of men any more than I would want a man to make fun of a woman. So to be a male chauvinist pig is not a good thing. But to be a female chauvinist pig is also not a good thing. Like if you're a woman who wants to, who is so upset about 
the patriarchy and male domination that you end up belittling men and making fun of men and wanting to be uh, domineering towards men. I feel like that's very similar to being a male chauvinist pig. So I would say stay balanced and be careful because if you want equality, that doesn't mean that you dominate men. It means that you are co-creators with men and that you are equal to men and not dominating so I would, to me, that's what being a real feminist is, is, is really believing in equality and standing up for women's rights and also standing up for, for men's rights, you know, the, the male right to be sensitive, to cry, you know, men are taught they're supposed to be macho, women are supposed to be sensitive, we're supposed to be the caretakers. I mean, there's all these stereotypes of what men are this and women are that. And so I feel like I want to break free from that as well. So I, I had an interesting experience when I modeled. I was a bit shy. I didn't tell them I do a podcast. Every week I do a podcast. And so maybe I will tell them that, that I do a podcast called Goddess Kring every week where I talk about a variety of topics. So I will say that I definitely believe in feminism, but the kind of feminism that is very ethical and fair and that is not an overcompensation for the patriarchy. Madonna talked about this. Madonna and Tori Amos are two women that I admire in the media, uh, you know, musicians, performers, they both, especially Tori Amos is an amazing songwriter who I've actually met and given painted shoes to, etc. I think some of you know that story, but um, I gave her hand painted shoes that I made for her in person. She wore them on stage at the Paramount Theater in Seattle, 1996, long story, fascinating experience, a little bit overwhelming. The musician, the musician Tori Amos, she and Madonna recently in her speech on the Golden Globes, she acknowledged and talked about how uh, part of what being a feminist is, is also standing your ground when other women don't like what you're doing. If you are doing what you love, if Madonna is doing what she loves and she believes in being a sexual being who is a powerful, strong woman on stage then she is being a strong, powerful woman who is loving and respecting herself. And part of her is, is a sexual being. And when, when other feminists put her down and say she's too sexual, she's exploiting herself, that is kind of a form of oppression. And so I would, she acknowledged that sometimes other women can be oppressive towards other women if you judge a woman for being too sexual. Even Gloria Steinem has said some things that upset me. It's kind of like assuming that all women that pose nude or do sexual type performance art, assuming that they're all just doing it to please the patriarchy and not realizing that some women are very sexual and very sensual and they want to express that. Just like when, I'm, when Mick Jagger gets on stage and struts around and is sexy or Prince or David Bowie, when they're up there being sexual men on stage. I mean, come on, music is partly a very sexual, sensual kind of thing when performers are on stage, you know, and actors are very beautiful people. Sexuality is part of that energy. When you're a performer on stage, whether you're an actor, a singer, a dancer, a musician, whatever, sexuality is part of us as beings, most of us as beings. And so Madonna was just pointing out that when women think you're a bad, you know, she was saying, well, I guess I'm a bad feminist because I refuse to uh, tone it down just because other women are not comfortable with my sexuality. So that's kind of what Madonna said. And Tori Amos has said the same thing about how sometimes women can betray other women. I mean, we're supposed to do this sister love thing. Sometimes when women are jealous of other women or just they feel threatened by somebody, if a woman feels comfortable being sexually expressive versus if a woman feels like they have to be a sex object and that their job is to please men and be a sex object, that's still good. But if someone is coming from a place of expressing their sexuality in a, in a, a authentic way, like I say, authentic ejaculation of my soul, Molten orange liquid glow, anger takes its toll, blowing status quo. That is a poem, the part of a poem that I wrote. Authentic ejaculation of my soul, meaning I'm authentically doing something that turns me on. I'm expressing myself in a, in a sensual way that turns me on. Authentic ejaculation of my soul. Molten orange liquid glow, meaning I'm in touch with my passion. I'm on fire. I'm full of passion. Anger takes its toll. That means if I repress myself, I get angry. 
blowing status quo, meaning I don't want to be held down and held back by people who think that I have to be a stereotypical female, whatever that means. If I'm a good feminist woman, then that means I'm supposed to be against uh, being sexy in a certain way for women. What, what I believe is that if a woman wants to be sexual or not sexual, then she should do what she loves and do it with love and respect for herself. Even if I don't agree with what another woman is doing, if she's doing it out of love for herself and she's authentically expressing herself in a different way than I would, then I would support that. Same thing if a man is doing something that I do or don't like, as long as he's not being, as long as a man or a woman is not being abusive to other people, if they're just truly expressing themselves and they happen to be eccentric or different and breaking the rules of normal society, which I think is a good healthy thing to do, I'm into being subversive and a little rebellious. I'm into following my heart. I'm into being authentic. I'm into learning and growing and ad admitting when I'm wrong and admitting when I make a mistake and trying to do better. You know, maybe I apologize too much when I make mistakes, but I believe in doing my best and I believe in being honest and authentic. So blowing status quo, the end of my poem would be, you know, you know, breaking free from the chains of thinking you have to be a conformist and, and just deal with the, the mediocre status quo. I mean, if someone is happy and comfortable with the status quo, that's fine, but I'm not necessarily comfortable with the status quo. And I, I like people who question the norms. Like I don't shave my armpits, but if a woman wants to shave her armpits, that's great. But if you break out in a rash, every time I shave my armpits, I get a rash. And I'm not into like waxing or tweezing or electrolysis. But if someone loves doing that, hey, just go ahead, do it. You know, have your pubic hair removed, you know, do your body grooming, whatever. But I prefer to just be natural. I tend to shave my legs, not always though. I don't really have a lot of hair on my legs right now anyway, who cares? But uh, I think if, if someone is a real feminist, that means that they accept that some people shave and some people don't. And, and conversely, if a man wants to shave his hair off, that's fine too. It's, it's like... Who cares? You know, do what you want. Do what you enjoy. Have the freedom to shave or not shave, to have long hair, short hair, shave your hair off, have your pubic hair, have your armpit hair. You know, what's the big deal about hair anyway? So there it is. So I think Amanda Palmer has said similar things. Amanda Palmer is also another woman that I admire. I think she's more of a real feminist. And feminists who are really judgmental towards other women and really harsh towards men, I don't think that's real feminism. I think real feminism comes from a place of love and wanting to be ethical and fair and respectful towards yourself, men, and women. And acknowledging and pointing things out when they're when they're unethical and unfair or abusive. I also got into a, a bit of a debate with a woman about when somebody is accused of being a pedophile. If so, if a man is falsely accused of being a pedophile, that is very damaging. And so I feel bad for men who are falsely accused of being a, a pedophile or a you know sexual abuser, a rapist a pedophile, you know, whatever, all of the horrible ways that you can abuse. If, man, if a man is falsely accused of doing that, that is very harmful to him. Now, conversely, if a man really is guilty of being a rapist or a pedophile or a child molester or whatever, then that's a serious thing and that needs to be acknowledged. And it's horrible when people who really are guilty of doing such things get away with it and it's never acknowledged that they actually did that. Now, that's horrible because the victims are the people that they abused and the denial is horrible. But I would also say that the denial of truth, so whether you're falsely accused of doing something abusive or you actually are guilty of doing something abusive and you get away with it because people are willing to deny it and pretend like it didn't happen and shove it under the rug and lie about it. Now that's awful. But my point with this feminist person that got mad at me, I was just trying to point out that wouldn't you agree that being falsely accused of something is horrible, just like
like actually doing something and getting away with it and being the victim of somebody who abused you and everyone's denying it and like, oh, that didn't happen. Oh, no, that didn't happen. You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You're lying. Then that's horrible. So basically, both scenarios are about being in denial of what the actual truth is. So what I'm interested in is what is the truth? Is somebody actually guilty of doing something abusive, rape, uh, molesting children, abusing people in whatever way, physically, mentally, sexually, emotionally? Or is somebody being falsely accused of something? Like there's people on death row who are falsely accused of murder and they did not even do the murder. Everyone just thinks they did. So thanks to DNA, we can now sometimes prove that somebody did not commit a murder that's on death row and free them. So what I'm interested in is the truth. Oh my gosh, we're out of time. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week. Questions and comments, welcome. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Goddess Kring. Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring.